I'm sitting here with Dr. Lawrence Steinberg, the Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Temple University at the Nice Ace Admissions Conference in April of 2019. Dr. Steinberg, thank you so much for sitting down with us and talking a bit with us about some of the provocative uh, topics you raised in our most recent session. Uh, how did you get involved in studying adolescence? How did, how did that It was happen? a complete accident. I, I went to graduate school in developmental psychology at Cornell. I did not know what I wanted to study. I knew, obviously, psychology. Wasn't sure what aspect of it. And I was um, assigned to be the research assistant to uh, a professor there named John Hill, who, who was one of the first persons, actually, in the United States to be studying normal adolescent development. So this is in 1974. And almost everything that had been written about teenagers in the psychological literature at that point was about kids with problems. And there had been virtually no research on community samples of teenagers, on normal adolescent development. He was one of the first persons to, to do that. So I was assigned to him, and I fell in love with it. And I, I have been doing adolescence research since, since then. So it's now going on 45 years. Well, that's a, that's a tremendous uh, time frame also in terms of what we know about the brain and how science and, and uh, research has changed. I'm sure you've been a part of that uh, actively. Could you talk a little bit about how what we know about adolescence is different now than it was when you began your career? Oh, well, it's hard to know where to begin because it is, it is so different. Of course, as, as you mentioned, um, the, the introduction into the study of adolescence of brain science is probably the biggest transformation that's taken place. Um, that was really made possible by the advent of imaging technology in the late 1990s. The first major studies of adolescent brain development weren't published until around the year 2000. So this is a very young field. But when I was in grad school, um, we were taught that the brain finished growing by the time we were 10 or 11, because in terms of its physical weight and, and volume, that's true. There's a lot going on inside the brain, but of course we couldn't see it, couldn't see what was going on in the living brain until we had brain imaging. Mm -hmm. So there's been a revolution in the study of adolescence there. I think that's one important change. I think a, a second important change is, is the attention to, um, to diversity-related issues. Um, I think it still was the case in the 1970s and early 1980s that most of the samples that were being studied by research psychologists were um, white middle-class suburban kids. Mm -hmm. And now um, that's certainly not the case at all. And we have a better understanding of the ways in which culture and uh, economics and even uh, geography um, affect the way that kids grow up. So those have been two very, very important changes. Interestingly, you know, one of them is kind of deep biology inside and one of them is wide cultural outside, but both of those have changed, have changed the field. Well, wow, that's fascinating. And could you think of an example of how that second change, the, the way we view diversity and the way samples um, are, are used within the scientific study of adolescence, has changed um, insights uh, that, that we have about that period in our lives? Well, I think, um, you know, because unfortunately, in the United States, there's such a strong relationship between um, ethnicity and, and socioeconomic status mm -hmm. that a lot of scientists have devoted a lot of their work to the study of poor children of color. Mm -hmm. So uh, we understand much, much more about the devastation uh, of poverty mm -hmm. on children's psychological and, and brain development and, and the impact of growing up in poor neighborhoods, independent of a child's own family situation and how neighborhoods affect kids' mm -hmm. development. Um, Fantastic. Now, t tell me a little bit about how societal changes over that same period of time have changed the way the adolescent experience is, um, is understood. How, how has the world and all that's changed in American culture affected the adolescent? Well, let me, let me answer that question in kind of a roundabout way. Um, the, the first is that there are some fundamental aspects of adolescence that haven't changed. I mean, all kids go through puberty and have to deal with uh, changes in sexuality and physical appearance and hormones that accompany that. All kids develop more advanced thinking abilities 
and that's true today and it was true 50 years ago. Uh, all kids have to deal with how do I make a successful transition from adolescence into the adulthood I'm being prepared for. But in terms of the changes that have taken place, I, I think one is the lengthening of adolescence, which I think is dramatic, um, that it now lasts until people are in their early, maybe even mid-20s. If we take when are they leaving school, establishing their own families and so forth, that is much later than it was in the past. Um, and and that, that, of course, changes a lot of things. I'll give you one specific example. Um, in the 1950s, people got married in their early 20s, typically. High school was frequently a place where you looked for your potential mate. Well, nobody looks for their mate anymore in high school now. I mean, even college seems a little early to be looking. And so that has changed the nature of romantic relationships and dating relationships in high school. So simply by changing the marriage age up to somewhere closer to 30 than from 20, you've changed the dynamics of something that happens long before that, as you've changed how adolescents see intimacy and, and dating. I think it's also the case that you, you have to consider the impact of the internet and uh, social media. Um, and and as, I, as I have said when I've spoken about this, it's complicated. And I, I th when people ask me, well, what's the effect of the internet on adolescent development? I say, well, that's like asking what the effect of books are on adolescent development. You know, it's like <laughs> the, you have to think about the content and not just about this, you know, this medium. Right. You, you actually said a few things that were um, perhaps counterintuitive for some of the people in the audience around depression and the adolescent uh, experience and social media. Maybe you could talk a little bit about... Um, about that and yeah. what, what you think is scientifically uh, valid and, and what is public perception. Right. Well, let me begin by saying there's a very, very long history of adults looking at the ills experienced by young people and attributing them to whatever the latest fad in technology or entertainment is. You can go back and read very interesting transcripts of congressional hearings about comic books in the 1950s <laughs> in which much terrible was being said about how our children were being destroyed by that. Um, back in the late uh, 1800s, um, people were talking about how novels were going to erode um, the minds of young people. And so we've heard this story before. We've heard it about those things. We've heard it about radio and television and computers and so forth. And so, uh, you know, I like to say to people, let's just wait and see how this plays out. We need a lot of research on this. Um, social media is the latest target of the finger pointing. Um, but the research on it doesn't support what the popular press prints. The research on it says that maybe there's a correlation between social media use and mental health problems in adolescence. But if there is, it seems to be very, very small. And we don't know which direction the relationship is because it's perfectly plausible that kids who are depressed turn to social media for comfort. I mean, one of the things that happens when you're depressed often is that you withdraw from your relationships, so those children may be lonely and they may spend time on their smartphones to deal with the loneliness. I, w I will say this, and I think this is an important statistic to keep in mind. Pew surveys show that more kids say that they feel better about themselves as a consequence of what they've seen on social media than say they feel worse about themselves. And so I, I'm sure there is a population of children out there whose mental health has been hurt by social media. They've been bullied, let's say, or they feel rejected or excluded. But there are a lot of kids out there who benefit in tremendous ways from social media, kids who have not been able to connect with people in their immediate environment and find a social network on social media, people with whom they can speak about um, important personal matters. So I, I, I think it's too, it, it's too heterogeneous a thing to say it has this effect on kids. It has different effects on different kids at different points in time. Mm, fascinating. 
And you know, I think about uh, the dance that has existed uh, perhaps forever, as long as there have been schools, between home and school about the raising of children. Yeah. Um, and uh, what do you think the role of schools is in the, the healthy development of adolescents these days? What, what messages would you give to teachers of adolescents and administrators in schools that uh, target that age group? What, what can schools do? Well, you know, schools, schools serve multiple purposes. I mean, we, we have to um, celebrate the role that schools play in teaching academic skills. I mean, that's primarily what they're there for, I think. Um, and, and the good job that many schools do at that. Um, a lot of schools don't do a very good job at it, but I think your member organization probably has a lot of schools that do good, a good job at that. But I think what we've now realized is that, in addition to that, schools need to do something to help facilitate the social and emotional development um, of students as well. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One is that we're increasingly seeing research showing that it's those non-cognitive skills, a term I don't particularly like, but that's what the field has labeled them, like grit and perseverance and determination and being able to work with other people um, and self-regulation. Those are the things that turn out to be very predictive of how well kids do in college, how well they do in the labor force, how well they do in life. And so I think that schools um, ought to try to see, to expand their role, to see helping to develop those non-cognitive, non-academic skills as a, an important part of, of, of what they're doing. Um, you asked your question, you began by asking about parents and schools. And, uh, you know, I think we have to see this as a collaborative relationship. It can't be just on one party's terms. Um, I mean, I've been a parent and I've been an educator and I've seen it from both sides. And, you know, schools want parents to be involved until parents get involved in the things that schools say, no, <laughs> we don't care about your opinion about this. Um, and, um, and schools want parents to be involved until parents say, you really want me to come to this program? <laughs> so I, I just think that they have to, the strong parent organization, school organization relationship can, can develop and plan activities that are gonna make each side feel that they're collaborating on a common goal, because they want the same thing, I think. They want their kids to be uh, more competent and, and happier and, and healthier. And in terms of that shared goal or shared outcome that both agree upon, um, you mentioned something I thought was pretty provocative, which is that, uh, or at least interesting to pursue a little deeper, which is this idea of self-regulation and self-control being such a, uh, oftentimes a predictor of success in, in human um, life. What, how much of that is hardwired and how much of that can parents and schools train or coach or teach in a student, a young person? Um, well, it's, it's hardwired in the sense that those brain systems are, are, are going to mature along a certain timetable um, in, in which they continue to develop during adolescence. That's part of the way our brain is wired. Um, if you're talking about how much of the differences among individuals are hardwired and how much can be changed, I think it's like any other nature-nurture thing. Everything about human beings is affected by both nature and nurture. Um, I don't personally think it's helpful to try to divide it up and say what percentage is which and what percentage is the other. Um, so f as an example, we know that there's a big genetic contributor to intelligence. I mean, maybe at least half. But that doesn't mean that people can't learn. Um, it, it may mean that people learn at different rates or it takes more intervention for some people to learn than others, whatever. So. I think even if you have a child who has been an impulsive child, um, there are still things you can do to help cultivate self-regulation um, in that child. And I think the, the good news is that the same interventions that I spoke about today are good for kids all, 
over that continuum. I mean, meditation, mindfulness training, has been used successfully as an intervention in juvenile detention facilities with kids who obviously have self-control problems. So it is, uh, it, 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 it is something that can be done regardless of what you think the, the hard wiring is. Mm. And I know that uh, I was a middle school principal for many years and one of the most frustrating things that teachers, administrators, and parents grapple with is that child who just can't seem to make a good decision to save his own life. Yeah. Um, and it's often a he. Uh, yes, you know, it is. But, um, you know, impulsive and, and just sort of unable to make a good decision and lacking a certain kind of self-control. So the thought that mindfulness training um, would be, uh, you know, uh, a technique to turn to is really uh, hopeful. Uh, you mentioned a couple others in your talk. What are some other things beside mindfulness training that you think would be effective um, to help uh, healthy adolescent development? Well, um you know, I think it's some of the schools, some of the things that schools typically haven't necessarily thought much about. We know sleep is very, very important for self-regulation and for better decision making. I mean, studies show that, and we know this as adults, when we don't get enough sleep, we're more likely to be impulsive in our decision making than if we're well rested. Exercise, very, very important for the development of these brain systems. I think that it's possible for schools to teach better decision making skills. And that's part, often, of the social-emotional learning curricula, SEL mm -hmm. curricula that lots of schools are now adopting. So I think there's some direct teaching that can be done around decision-making, but I think some of these other activities that can help nurture um, self-regulation uh, you know, from the ground up yeah. can be helpful. You know, over the course of your career uh, and also in your historical research into the past, um, You've, you've seen how adolescence has changed and developed in response to social changes, how, how uh, certain things are constant uh, despite uh, social changes. Do you think it's harder to be an adolescent now than it's ever been? Um, I think it's harder for some, but not harder for all. I think that, um, I think there are th I think it's very hard um, for the very affluent communities um, because the competition to get into excellent colleges and universities has just gone off the charts. And I think that creates a lot of stress in kids' lives, um, not just in ac the academic world, but in extracurriculars and in, in, in uh, compiling a portfolio that's going to be compelling. Um, I think clearly is very hard for kids growing up in very poor communities. We know the income gap has gotten wider. Um, there are lots of young people come up under terrible, impoverished conditions where there's violence in their communities and um, where their schools are not necessarily very good, and I think that's harder for them too. In the middle between, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not sure. Um, I, I think we don't I think we don't do enough to make those schools better. I think a lot of the public discussion has not been on the big swath in the middle of kids. And the surveys of those kids that have been done here tell us that a lot of those students are bored in school. Um, so I guess it's hard to grow up in the sense that they're in this environment in which they're bored a lot of the time. I, I presented some data recently in which I showed a chart of the proportion of American high school students who say they're usually bored while they're in school. It was 50% of ninth graders. Wow. And that's not occasionally bored, that's usually bored. So there are a lot of kids out there that were not really engaging and challenging, and that's hard for kids. Um, you know, on, I mean, on, on the other hand, uh, I, I think that they, the kids have access to information that they never had access to before because of the internet, um, and, and, and there are good things that come from those technologies. Um, I, I, think it's hard, I think it's hard to say. Wow. If, uh, I guess, to boil down your argument into a sort of a specific, um, you know, message to schools, uh, if you thought, if a school came to you, or if you were observing a school and the people who were leading that school said, you know, we really want to 
prioritize our adolescent programming. We really want to build a better school for adolescents. We feel like we're not doing as good a job as we could be. What do you think their highest priority should be? What's the first thing they should try to do? I think they, they should try to focus on the social and emotional capacities that need to be cultivated. Um, both, both because we, we understand how much they contribute to success in later life, but also because they will improve the behavior and performance and engagement of kids in school right now. So let me just conclude maybe by saying that I don't think it's right to think of what we do during adolescence as only valuable for how they're going to turn out in the future. We should care about giving kids a good life now as, as well. And I'd like to think about how schools can help do that too. Well, that's a great message. Thank you so much for your time, okay, Dr. Steinberg, thanks. and, and look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, all right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right.